So I'd like to talk a little bit about the problems with carbon-14 dating. So the methods of dating archaeological uh, specimens, uh, they almost always use uh, carbon-14 and there's inherent problems in it. So uh, this is the kind of the breakdown. So at death, there's 100%. Every 5,730 years, 50% of the carbon-14 leaves the specimen, and it's only good for about 55,000 years. So there's actually a couple more steps here. There's, there's uh, two more steps. So the carbon-14 is produced in the atmosphere. It oxidizes and forms carbon dioxide. The plants absorb the carbon-14 carbon during photosynthesis. Uh, the plants, animals consume plants, is incorporated in their bone and tissue, and when they die, they stop taking carbon-14, it starts to decay to form nitrogen-14. So, let me go over how carbon-14 is done. Uh, the best lab that, that does carbon-14 is actually uh, in southern Florida, I actually seen it done, so this is how it's done. You have to tell them approximate age of what you you have to give them a ballpark figure to shoot at which alone tells you how iffy it is so they shave off you know the the outermost part of it then they put it into four four separate uh, baths of various solvents to further clean it then it's burned, it's totally burned and turned into carbon dioxide. Then the carbon dioxide is converted into a piece of graphite. The graphite is then put into a mass spectrometer and the ratios are determined therein. Now the inherent problems of this, in the real world there's water moving around. Other things are affecting it, but it's 99% of the false readings are caused by water moving stuff around. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example that I had, and it didn't have to do with carbon-14, it had to do with uranium. Uh, uranium salts can be washed down. Now there's a uranium to lead test, uh, actually not germane to what I'm talking about now, but just to give you an example, I was brought in, it doesn't matter where this was, but it was a, a, a nuclear power plant, and they had taken tons and tons of uranium, and they stored, they called it storing it natural. So this was unprocessed uranium. It was just brought on site for use several years down the road. And it was buried. They call it the natural burial. So this is, un, in other words, they, they took it out of the uranium mine uh, in Colorado, and they uh, put it in this uh, nuclear facility and just buried it in the ground, you know, tons and tons of it, and just covered it up. I mean, they, they had security on the ground, so, uh, you know, it was all fenced in with cameras and everything. So years passed by, and the place is an area where there's a lot of rainfall. And they dug it up, to, and they were going to start using it for processing. Well... They were missing a significant amount of it, enough actually if you were to enrich it to make two bombs. So the mystery was, uh, you know, the game was afoot. So they brought several people on that think, let's just say, think outside the box, uh, think differently, and I was brought in. And I actually figured out where it was. So. I looked at the almanac and I looked at uh, the, the actual weather data for the area and the place that had experienced enormous amounts of rainfall over the period of time. And since it was called a natural burial, the, we actually found 80% 80 per, 80 of the missing uranium had, wa had actually just washed in the ground, had leached and moved across. So they had buried it here and it had actually just moved and scattered, much like a Delta fan. Now we didn't find all of it, but it was enough to, to uh, 80%, it was enough to find that, that that's, that's, what, uh, uh, that's where it went. The, the, the missing parts were just because we couldn't find them, 
because uh, they'd either gone down into the ground or had dispersed enough. So it didn't, it didn't, that, that was the mystery. The mystery was solved at that point. Uh, another problem with, uh, that I'll, I'll point out in uh, a carbon 14 dating. So two wooden presidency uh, little tokens, uh, one for Eisenhower. Here's, here's, you know, this is caused by moving water. Moving water is the biggest agent that causes carbon-14 to go off. Uh, and so anyway, these two tokens, one was a I Like Ike button, and another one was a Nixon for uh, president. So they were within a couple of years of each other. There was, you know, Nixon ran against uh Kennedy in 60 and I like Ike the I like Ike button could have been uh, you know any one of the either one of the two so it was when they were within a decade of each other uh, and the trees that, that that were made that they made the button they, they actually traced them back to the, the place that made them they weren't more than a couple of hundred years old on in each count uh, they were made by a, a mainline manufacturing lumber company, so it was actually easy to pretty easy to trace the actual origin of these trees. Uh, they were they were farm trees. They were trees that were grown specifically for lumber, so it wasn't that hard to figure out. Anyway, the uh, the tests on both of these buttons uh, revealed they were thousands of years old. Well, they weren't. The trees weren't even thousands of years old. The buttons themselves were obviously from a manufacturer from a tree, but you put water on them, people touching them, people's hands have moisture on them. Uh, you know, there's even carbon coming off of the, in, in the oils of the hand, which kind of screws things up even on top of it. So anyway, it was, it was thought to be several thousand years old, much like one of these things is several thousand years old. Uh, so there's inherent problems with it. And another inherent prop problem, uh, I, like to, I like to bring this one up too. So the Shroud of Turin, the weave in it is of something that was manufactured and available in ancient Israel ancient, slash ancient Rome at the time. The pollens found in the shroud match two areas of the world. Italy, where it's been for the last several hundred years, and then the Middle East, uh, where it was initially made, and I do believe it was the burial cloth of Jesus. Uh, but anyway, it went through two fires, and one of the fires left was in it was in a silver lined reliquary box, and you can see the burn marks along the edges of the shroud where uh, the silver melted into it. So exposed to water twice, changed the dates that they found on it when, when the shroud was brought forth and they let them burn a little tiny bit to make the carbon dioxide switch to graphite to be tested in this, uh, with mass spectrometer. So carbon-14 isn't as exact as you would think it is. I also have a nice little story. So I was in... I took some classes at UT Austin uh, back in the 80s and uh, about this specifically, so I was very, very competent on the facts. So the inheritor of Carl Sagan's title as the scientist for the people went to Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson has middling science reasoning skills at best so i'm at a symposium and he's up there talking about uh, dinosaurs and carbon 14 dating and uh, i point out that carbon 14 doesn't work on dinosaurs and he laughs and says okay yeah i stand erected so i wouldn't even listen to anything that guy says thank you like share and subscribe i'm out